from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to welcome all of those that have joined by television as well and tell you that we are at the University of New Mexico in their beautiful, beautiful arena, one of the most beautiful anywhere in the world. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the second chapter, the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. The second chapter of the book of Hebrews, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, in the Greek, that's very, very strong language. In other words, he's talking about the Old Testament. It's very important to study and read the Old Testament. Give heed to it. Study it, lest you let those things slip that are taught there. The Scripture says, "...in every transgression and every disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation?" And in the context here, he's talking about the salvation through Jesus Christ. How that Jesus Christ came down from heaven, as we heard a moment ago, and was made a little lower than the angels. Now, of course, Christ is far above all angels and principalities and powers in the hierarchy of heaven and the universe. But when he came to earth, he was made lower than the angels, identifying himself with us. And when you come and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are made higher than the angels. You are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll never know till you get to heaven what it means to receive Christ, what full salvation is. But as I look into your future of this generation, it's not a pretty picture. In fact, many of the statements that are being made today are very despairing and almost hopeless. I received a letter from a radio commentator some time ago, and he said, Billy, he said, I listened to your preaching and he said, you know, he said, you're too discouraging. Give us a little hope. Well, I'm a little bit like Jeremiah. My wife calls me Jeremiah sometimes. Because, you know, Jeremiah watched for 40 years the deterioration of his country. He saw his country captured. He saw the city of Jerusalem destroyed. He lived through all that. And he's called the weeping prophet. And I look at America tonight. And I look at the world tonight, and I'll be honest with you, I weep over it. I weep in my soul and in my heart. And I cry out, and I say, God, how shall we escape? And it's moving in on us fast now. Events are accelerating very fast. And we see all over the world many of the old traditions and the old things that people believed in crumbling and shaking throughout the world. And we ask ourselves, is there any hope? A London editorial said the other day, Western civilization is committing suicide. A very prominent churchman in this country went recently to Asia. He came back. He said, all of my ideas have changed. I went out an optimist. I'm a pessimist. I don't think the world can last. There's a philosophy of despair. Bertrand Russell, before he died, said, the best we can hope for is unyielding despair. Now think of that. Here's a brilliant man, a man of letters, that says the only thing we can hope for is unyielding despair, hopelessness everywhere. A headline the other day said, scientists despair as they move the atomic clock forward once again. Now, the Scripture says in Ephesians that at that time ye were without Christ, having no hope, without God in the world. Now, without Christ, I don't think I would have any hope. One of the United States senators said to me a few weeks ago, I, I, was, going in, I was eating in the Senate dining room with some senator friends, and he called me over to his table. And he said, Billy, he said, are you an optimist or a pessimist? said, we're having an argument here at the table. I said, I'm an optimist. He said, how can you be an, opt be an optimist in a world like we're living in? Now, here's a United States senator saying that, and he's been in the Senate a long time. I said, I'm an optimist because I've read the last page of the Bible. I know it's going to come out all right. 
God has a plan. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I look at the world scene today and I don't see much hope for permanent peace. I look at the world scene today and I look at the American scene. And I see corruption almost everywhere we turn. Every time they appoint an investigating committee, they turn up a bunch of snakes. Local government, high government, federal government, state government, business, every area of life, it seems, we have our corruption and we have our cutting of the corners and our cheating and our lying. Now, that doesn't mean that we're worse than any other generation because every generation's been doing it. All have sinned. We're all sinners. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's always been true. And my reason for standing up here preaching today is not to try to save this perishing world in which we live. It's not going to be saved. You see, we have built our civilization on a cracked foundation, the cracked foundation of sin, human iniquity. And it's not going to be saved by any actions of the United Nations. We are told to do all we can for world peace. We are told to do everything we possibly can to preserve the very best qualities that are in life, whether they're in the East or the West. We are told to make life as peaceful as we possibly can. Blessed are the peacemakers. But in the very end, we won't succeed totally. We might succeed for a generation. We can patch it up here a little and there a little and there a little. But in the end, we are headed toward world judgment in which there will be a tribulation, there will be an antichrist, and there will be a judgment. But at the end of all that, when man stands at Armageddon and the human race is ready to destroy itself, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Hopeless, yet there is hope. Now, what are people doing about it when they read the headlines and watch their television screens? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're trying to escape. Trying to escape. How do people escape? Some of them escape by just daydreaming, just making out like it's not going to happen at all. Or they escape through evil imaginations as they did in the days of Noah. You see, Satan turns himself into an angel of light and he says, go out and just live it up and have a good time and forget it all. There's the escape of pleasure, a flight into passion, appetite, and desire. A man wrote and he said, I'm going to drown my troubles in alcohol, and millions are doing that, just that. A businessman said, I'm going out and having my fling on a weekend with, a, with my secretary. The world is so bad, I'm going to have my good time while I can get it. One in every two marriages is breaking. Wife swapping all the things that are going on today, unbelievable things. How long? How long is God going to allow it to continue? How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The Bible warns against the deceitfulness of pleasures. Things are that serious. John Steinbeck wrote to Adlai Stevenson once a letter. And here's a part of that letter. He said this, John Steinbeck said this, If I wanted to destroy a nation, I would give it too much and I would have it on its knees, miserable, greedy, and sick. And he said, that's where America is right now. James once said in the fifth chapter, your gold and silver are cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasures for the last days, but you won't be able to spend it. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And a lot of you are just killing yourselves trying to get just a little corner on the world and you're losing your soul. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? One of our famous senator's wives was quoted in the press the other day as saying, Dear God, where has all the happiness gone? Real happiness and joy and peace seem to be disappearing. People are afraid to walk down the streets at night of the average city, raping, mugging, crime, murder. 
How shall we escape? The final escape, of course, is suicide. And there was a great theologian, one of our greatest theologians, president of a, had been president of one of our most prestigious seminaries. He and his wife had a suicide pact, and they committed suicide about three weeks ago. And people are committing suicide. But you know what Amos said? Amos in the ninth chapter says, Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, there will I bring them down. Suicides among those under 19 years of age doubled in the last two years. This crowd sitting over here. If you're under 19, suicides doubled last year in America. And then there's another escape, especially on the university campus today. There's the escape of radicalism. Join a radical cause. Let's overthrow the government. And I heard on television the other day one of those fellows in the 1960s from the University of California, and he fled off to Algeria somewhere, and they were interviewing him. He'd cut, he'd already cut his hair, shaved his beard. I didn't recognize him. I knew him by name. He had three children. He said, no, he said, if I could get back into America, he said, I'd fit into that system because he said, I've traveled enough around the world to know that the American system is the greatest system in the whole world. You see, what you do, what you do, you can, you substitute one crowd of sinners for another crowd of sinners. You're never going to get anybody that's totally 100% pure and totally honest. There was only one man that ever lived like that, and that was Jesus. And what we're looking for today is the perfect man, the perfect politician, the perfect businessman, the perfect labor union leader. You're not going to find it. So you have to deal in society with human nature as it is. Now let me tell you, there are thousands of honest politicians, as honest as they can be, as honest as the preachers, because the Bible teaches that all of us have come short of God's glory. I know some of the finest men in Washington and in our state capitals that we've ever had. But Sir Winston Churchill said once, our problems are beyond us. He said, there is no way out. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What is our hope? Well, I want to tell you, it's very important that you have some hope. Because you see, you not only have world problems that I've mentioned, but you've got your own personal problems. You've got your own personal pressures. You've got your own personal hell that you're living in right now, and you're looking for a way out and a way of escape. How am I going to get out from under this load I'm carrying? Maybe you're failing in, at the university. Maybe it's a broken love affair. It may be something else. Pressure from your parents. Whatever it may be. Maybe your parents are broken up and it's torn you up. And you feel the pressure and you want to run and hide and you want to escape. You've tried the drug route. You've tried the alcohol and it hasn't worked. Well, it's very important that you have hope. If you ever lose your hope, you're finished. Old or young. What oxygen is for the lungs, such is hope for the meaning of human life. And the fate of humanity is dependent, I believe, in its supply of hope. A famous cardiologist was written up the other day and he said, hope is the medicine that I use most of all. When a man has had a heart attack, he said, I try to give him hope immediately. A well-known professor of medicine said in this state, hope is like medicine. How shall we escape? The Reader's Digest was quoted recently as saying, in order to be happy, a person must have someone to love something to do, and something to hope for. What is your hope? What do you place your hope in? The government? The educational system? What is your hope? 
Well, I'm going to tell you where my hope is tonight. My hope is not in an organization. My hope is not in a plan. My hope is not in a treaty. My hope is in a man, a person, that sits at the right hand of God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God has put in him all authority on heaven and earth. And my hope is centered totally, completely in him. And I want to tell you, I have been a failure in my life. I have been a sinner. I have broken God's laws. I deserve judgment. I deserve hell. But he came and died for me on that cross. And because he came and died on that cross, I am saved. I have escaped. I have hope. I know that I'm going to heaven. And I have God's presence with me right here now to help me in this present life. Do you have that hope? The Bible talks about the hope of the resurrection. Paul speaks of the hope of the resurrection. And he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Are you a Christian? You say, yes. Somewhere when I was a boy or girl, I received Christ as Savior. But that's as far as it goes. Paul said, if it's in this life only that I have hope, he said, then I'm miserable. But he said, there is out yonder a continuing city. There's a city whose builder and maker is God. There's heaven to come. And the Bible talks about the resurrection. Yes, we're going to be raised from the dead. Yes, there's the hope of the resurrection and there's the hope of righteousness. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, says Paul in Galatians 5.5. 5. Now this word really is the same as the word we use, justification. When God forgives, God says from the cross, I love you, I'm willing to forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. That means just as though you had never sinned. Now, suppose somebody does something against me. I say, all right, I forgive you. You're forgiven, but I can still remember it. Ten years later, I'll see you and I'll say, yeah, I remember what you did to me when I was back there at the university. I forgave you, but I can't ever forget what you did to me. But you see, God doesn't do that way. God forgives and forgets and justifies you just as though you'd never committed the sin he can't even remember it incredible but that's what happens the hope of righteousness because you see I am now clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and when God looks at me he doesn't see the old evil bad heart of Billy Graham he sees Jesus who lives in my heart and he says because Jesus lives in your heart you're forgiven. You're clothed in his righteousness. So I can claim tonight by faith a righteousness, not my own, the righteousness of Christ. Because God says, be holy even as I'm holy. I can't be as holy as God, but I'm going to have to be as holy as God if I get to heaven. And the only way I can be as holy as God is to appropriate the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when I get to the gates of heaven, they're going to look at my clothes and they're not going to see this old suit I've got on. They're going to see that I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And I'm going to go in on the merits of his shed blood on that cross. Yes, there is a hope. And then not only is there the hope of righteousness, but there's the hope of eternal life. To live forever with him. And there's the hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our hope, said Paul to Timothy. You know, the New Testament is an exciting book to read 
because it's so full of hope and expectancy. The Scripture says, For our hope is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Scripture says, And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of Jesus Christ our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever and ever. And that's the same hope and it's the same picture of two lovers that have been separated for a while awaiting their reunion. All the heartbreaks of history will end in the meeting of lovers. All the agony of the ages will end in the meeting of lovers. Have you ever been separated from someone you love? You've got a girlfriend or boyfriend you haven't seen in about three or four months? Boy, wait till you see each other. That's one of the great things about being an evangelist and traveling. My wife and I have a lot of goodbyes, but boy, when we meet each other again, it's a honeymoon all over again. I look forward to her coming. I hope she looks forward to seeing me. At least she says she does. And that's what it's going to be on that glorious day when Christ comes. And we're going to be caught in the air to meet him. And it's like two lovers coming together. What hope we have. Suppose we didn't have a Bible. Suppose we had no salvation, no cross, no empty tomb. Suppose we had nothing to give except do your best, try to patch it up, do, do what you can. But we have a hope. There's a plan in this book of redemption. God has a plan for the future. And the future is all outlined. Your future. And God is interested in you. How shall you escape if you neglect this salvation? If you neglect Jesus Christ, notice it says neglect. Maybe you're not going to reject Christ, you just neglect Him. Oh, you'll join a church, all right. Maybe you're already a member of the church, but as far as your personal relationship with Christ, you just neglect Him. You really don't have time for Him. He's not first in your life. Something else is first. He demands first place. He demands that He be Lord and Master of your whole life. I'm going to ask you tonight to march for Christ. Hundreds of these young people had a march of love this afternoon, a march for love. And they came into this stadium. I'm going to ask you tonight to march for Christ, to get under his banner and say, I want him to forgive my sins. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I'm going to escape the judgment when it comes. I want to have the power in this present life to escape all the terrible things that happen to every one of us. That doesn't mean you escape problems and difficulties and circumstances that may be bad. It means that he gives you a peace and a joy in the midst of them. That's the escape that we have. The escape is not running off and hiding somewhere. The escape is getting into the Word of God and in personal fellowship with Christ all day long. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front of this platform and say tonight, I want forgiveness. I want a new life. I want to know I'm going to be raised from the dead. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I'm going to ask you to get up and come and stand in front of the platform. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. And then we're going to give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends. That's all you have to do. A simple act of faith in saying, tonight I want Christ. Get up and come quickly. Men, women, young people, hundreds of you. We're going to wait on you right now. Television can see here in this great university arena hundreds of people coming to know Christ as Savior. We've seen the largest percentage of people coming to Christ here in Albuquerque, I think, of any American city that we've ever been to. Hundreds and thousands of people this past week have said yes to Christ. You can do the same where you are right now. You can bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, and he'll do it. I hope that you'll make that commitment tonight and that you'll go to church next Sunday. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. The ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews and I'll come to the text a little bit later. 
I want to speak tonight on the subject, three things, three things you cannot do without. Three things you cannot do without. My father was not a poor man. He was not a wealthy man. He would be called middle income. He made whatever you can make on a two or three hundred acre red dirt farm in North Carolina. I never did look at his bank account, never knew how much he made. He seemed to have enough on the table and we always had one suit of clothes a year and we had five cents of ice cream every Saturday night and we did pretty well. Look at the Waltons. You'll see a little bit about how we lived in those days in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, Immanuel Kant once said, a man is rich not by what he owns, but by what he can do without. You're not rich by what you own, but what you can do without. I've always remembered that statement. And as we're entering a recession, I guess we're in one, or a depression, whatever you call this that we're in, You'd be amazed at what you can do without. We may have to go back and live like we lived when I was a boy, and I, but I'll tell you, you could walk down the streets of all the towns around there and you wouldn't be afraid of being hit over the head or mugged. You never heard of a rape. I guess they had them. I never heard of them. I don't ever recall hearing about a murder in our community. And somehow or another, we children thought we were the happiest people in the world. And we had to work from three in the morning till sunset. My mother always served breakfast at 5.30 every morning. And we didn't know how bad off we were. <laughs> now, the Bible says there are at least three things you can't do without. If you are to have joy and peace and assurance and your sins forgiven and to know that you're going to heaven. What are they? The first one is found in Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In other words, if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross and shed his blood for your sins, you could never have forgiveness you would be a lost soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Because from Genesis to Revelation, blood is shed. And why? Leviticus 17, 11, Moses said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, if you're an average person, you have five quarts of blood circulating in your body every 23 seconds. Blood carries the garbage out without contamination. It's the most mysterious substance in the whole anatomy. Nobody exactly knows all about the blood. And we're all related by blood. You may be a black man, a brown man, a yellow man, whatever your background, you are related to me by blood. Our blood can, if it's the same type, can be interchanged within the races. The scripture says, the apostle Paul said, God hath made of one blood all the nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. When I have a blood transfusion, as I've had on several occasions when I've had operations, I didn't ask him, what's the color of the man's skin that blood came out of. I just want to get it in there fast as I can. Our blood, we're related. We're related to Adam. Adam and Eve were the first parents. And Adam and Eve sinned against God and they broke God's law. They rebelled against God. And then an interesting thing happened. They tried to cover their sins with fig leaves. And they couldn't do it. You know what God did? God went out and slew some animals and blood was shed and God was teaching man from the Garden of Eden to this very hour that if you are to have forgiveness of sin, blood has to be shed. 
And you go all the way down through the Old Testament, it's the same thing. I go in the New Testament, it's the same thing. When Cain and Abel, they were the first sons of Adam and Eve. Cain came along and brought his sacrifice, but there was no blood in it. Abel brought his and there was blood in it. God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's and Cain got mad and became jealous of his brother and killed him and you had the first murder in the history of the human race according to the Bible. And then you remember that night in Egypt. God said, I'm going to kill as a judgment in Egypt the firstborn of every house in all of Egypt and every Jew remembers that even to this hour and they celebrate it every year. I want you to take some blood, an animal, slay an animal, take the blood and put it on the doorpost and when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Not when I see your good works, not when I see how rich you are, not when I see what church you belong to, but when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Why? You go to the communion. On Sunday, and you take of the wine or the grape juice, whatever your church serves. That wine or that grape juice stands for blood, the blood that was shed on the cross. John the Baptist cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Why did he call him a lamb? Because as a lamb, he was going to the cross. His blood was to be shed for your sins. He takes away the sins of the world. And that blood tonight can cleanse every sin you've ever committed. There's power in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Do you want forgiveness tonight? Do you want forgiveness of every single sin? Because you see, you cannot get into heaven if you're guilty of a single sin when you get to the entrance of heaven. Every sin has to be forgiven and there's no way for sin to be forgiven except by Jesus Christ's work on the cross. Now blood, of course, is symbolic in the Bible. It means the life of Christ was given for us at the cross. And when he died on that cross and shed that blood, God accepted that sacrifice instead of you having to make a sacrifice. In other words, you won't have to spend a day at the judgment. You won't have to spend one day in hell. You will be forgiven as though you had never sinned by the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The scripture says, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without stain. One of the most popular songs a couple years ago was, Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. And in Revelation 12 we read, They overcame how? By the blood of the lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus paid the ransom. I read the other day about this Italian playboy that was kidnapped, and they're holding him right now for ransom for $16 million. And there's a popular song right now also that says, Don't pay the ransom. But if Jesus had not been willing to go to that cross and pay the ransom with his own blood, you couldn't be saved. You couldn't have forgiveness. And on the cross, God is saying something to all of us. He's saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you so much that I'm willing to see my only son die. The angels couldn't believe it. They pulled their swords, 72,000 of them ready to come and sweep this whole planet into oblivion and rescue the Son of God. But he never called them. He said, I came to do the will of my Father. He died and he shed his blood on that cross for you. And without the shedding of blood, you could not be forgiven. The second thing that you can't do without, Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. Just turn a couple pages over. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, 
it is impossible to please him. Now, Christ has already done the work on the cross, but now comes your part. Without faith, you cannot please him. Hebrews 11 has been called God's hall of fame. And after this passage, some of the men and women of faith are listed like Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and even a prostitute, Rahab, because she too believed in God and proved her faith by her works. Well, you say, what is faith? I've committed all kinds of sins and, and, and I know that I, I have to have the blood and now I find out I have to have faith what is faith? How do I get this faith? Do you know what faith is? I'm not sure I can explain it all to you, but faith is believing and receiving what God has revealed. What God has revealed in this book, what God has revealed in nature, what God has revealed in conscience. And it can be defined as that trust in the God of the Scriptures and in Jesus Christ whom He sent for salvation. Faith is personal trust apart from any works in Jesus Christ. I cannot work my way to heaven. After I receive Christ as Savior, I prove that I'm a Christian by my works. But you cannot do one single thing to earn one minute in heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. My salvation does not depend on even 1% of what I do or am. It depends entirely on the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and the fact that I have received him as my Lord and my Savior. But after I'm saved, I am sinning every minute and every day if I'm not working for my Savior and abiding in him. And faith without works is dead, said James. Now, the Bible teaches that faith is the only approach to God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And the Bible tells us that faith is commanded. Jesus said, have faith in God. And that's an imperative there in Matthew uh, or Mark 11. And then on another occasion, John said, and this is his commandment, this was the commandment of Jesus, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. It's a command. God commands you. He commands you. He gives you an order. Believe. Believe, believe, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's no other way that you can approach God, no other way you can know God, no other way you can come in contact with God except through faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. What is faith? the reception of the gospel, confidence in God and His Word, being confident of this very thing, a total dependence on Christ for our forgiveness and for the fulfillment in our lives. Did you ever hear the story of John Payton, the great missionary in the New Hebrides? He was translating the Scriptures, trying to learn their language. And he couldn't translate the word faith and he worked on it for months and months and months and he couldn't find a word for faith. And one day he saw a man lying on a low reclining chair that supports the weight of the whole body. And John Payton said, what are you doing? And the man said, reclining. Payton jumped up and he said, I've got my word for faith. It's reclining on Jesus. And here's how he translated it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever reclineth his whole weight upon him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He that reclineth his whole weight upon him is not condemned, but he that reclineth not his whole weight upon him is condemned already because he hath not reclined his whole weight upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
Have you reclined your whole weight upon Christ and Christ alone? Or are you counting on a little bit of your own goodness and counting on a little bit of church anity? I can't go down here to a church and get on a pew and recline on the pew and say I'm saved. This pew is saving me. No, it's not. You recline on Christ. Your faith is in Christ, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faith. Faith means that I receive and that I do something about it. I'm asking you tonight to put your whole weight on Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. Just Jesus. And then the third thing that you cannot do without. First, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Second, without faith, you cannot please Him. Thirdly, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, of course, Jesus in this chapter is talking about the vine and the branches, and He's talking about fruit bearing. In other words, without me, you cannot bear any fruit. After you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit is the representative of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father. He went away. He sent the Spirit of God here to this earth. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you put your whole weight on Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within you, and He lives through you and in you, and He lives the Christian life through you. Now, one of the most important chapters in all the Bible is this 15th chapter of John. And those of you that come forward tonight, we're going to give you a Gospel of John. And I hope you'll read this chapter right away because it's an important picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to Him. You see, this is the grapevine that He's talking about. And grapevines were grown all over Palestine in those days. And they needed a lot of attention. They grew fast. And they were drastically pruned every December and January. And they bore two kinds of branches, those grapevines. One was fruit-bearing, and the other bore no fruit at all. So the, not the, the branches that bore no fruit were drastically pruned back so that they would drain away none of the strength from the root and from the vine itself. Now, the wood of the vine has the curious characteristics that it wasn't good for anything. It was too soft for any purpose, so they would take these false branches, these branches that didn't bear anything, and have a big bonfire with them. And Jesus says His followers are like that. Some of them are lovely, fruit-bearing branches of Himself. Others are useless because they bear no fruit. And Christians, professing Christians, whose Christianity consists of just professing without practice, words without deeds. I believe the Bible from cover to cover, and I believe the whole the cover because it says Holy Bible, somebody said. A man told me, he said, I'm a fundamentalist with a big F. And he... He looked as mean as I've ever seen. He meant it too. And he was. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're right with God. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and gentleness and long-suffering. All those fruits of the Spirit. They are to characterize the true believer in Jesus Christ. By their fruits ye shall know them, said Jesus. By their fruits ye shall know them. There are many of you here tonight, you look like a Christian. You act like a Christian in many ways, but deep inside there's no abiding in Christ. There's no life, there's no sap. The fruit isn't there. Three ways in which we can be useless branches. One, 
you can refuse to listen to Christ at all. Second, you can listen and then render him lip service unsupported by deeds. Thirdly, you can accept him as master and make him Lord of your life. Because when you come to Jesus Christ, you not only accept him as Savior, but you accept him as Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He must be Lord of your eyes, Lord of your ears, Lord of your tongue, Lord of your hands, Lord of your feet, Lord of your pocketbook, Lord of your bank account, Lord of your family. He's first in every area of your life. Is he in yours? Or are you among the branches that need to be cut off? And he said that he cuts them off, he prunes them back, and they're thrown into the fire. Always remember that the branch that bears no fruit must be destroyed if the rest of the vine is to be preserved. Even among true believers that's true because we have in the Bible a very strange passage that I don't have time at this moment to go into the sin unto death. I believe that there are Christians, true believers, that many times die before their time. Are you abiding in Christ? Jesus withdrew himself into solitary places to meet God, and we must do the same thing. We must keep contact with him every day. It must be constant and deliberate. Never a day when we do not sense his presence. And without this abiding, you cannot do anything that will be spiritually pleasing to God. Without me, you can't bear supernatural fruit. But with him, I can love that fellow over there that normally I wouldn't love. With him, I can be gentle when normally I might want to hit him in the face. With him in my life living through me, I can forgive the wrongs that have been done and the things that were said. With him, the life can be lived because you see, nowhere in the New Testament does it tell me, Billy Graham, to live a Christian life. It tells me that the old Billy Graham must die and Christ must live through me and in me. He does the living through me if I'm daily, moment by moment, abiding in Him. It's His sap that gives me the strength and the life, the spiritual life that I must have. By their fruits ye shall know them. Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Without faith I cannot please Him. Without me ye can do nothing. I'm going to ask you tonight to receive Christ into your heart. Let Him forgive your sins. I'm going to ask you to recline all your weight. Maybe you've put 90% of your weight, but I'm asking you tonight all your weight on Christ. I'm asking you tonight to make him Lord as well as Savior of your life. You may be a member of the best church in town, but you really need Christ in your heart. You may not be a member of any church, whoever you are and whatever you are. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you. Get up and come and stand in front of this platform. And say by coming, I want Christ in my heart. I want forgiveness. I want to put my whole weight on him. And after you've all come and stood here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. We're going to give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. If you've come with friends and relatives or come in a bus, they'll wait. It won't take but just a moment in this stadium. You come quickly right now. Hundreds of you from everywhere. You may be in the choir. And you've been singing all these nights, but you're not sure that Christ is in your heart. You come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.
As you that are watching by television can see, there are hundreds of people here at the University of New Mexico that are coming to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make your commitment where you are now. You can put your whole weight on him and say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life, and he will. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 34. Beginning at verse 34, I want to speak on the subject tonight of Jaws. And I'll tell you why I call it Jaws in just a moment. Here's the words of Jesus, Matthew 12. Old generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof at the judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign. Show us a sign so that we can believe in you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're only going to get one sign from me. And that's the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. During the past few months, we've been listening and hearing and reading all about the Hollywood's blockbuster of the year. It's already been viewed by one out of every four Americans. And it's the account of a killer shark in the waters around Martha's Vineyard in New England who swallows victims and delimbs a lot of victims. And they made a motion picture out of it that's shown all over the world. And Time magazines made a cover story of it. And they could only liken it to Jonah and the whale. They could only find that one literary reference in literature of Jonah and the whale. And so the front pages of our newspapers have carried story after story about how people are afraid to go swimming on the beaches in California and Oregon and Washington and up and down the East Coast this past year or this past summer. And then I read the other day about a man in Australia that lassoed a two-ton shark in Australian waters. Well, I can understand that because I've seen a many a shark in Australia. Cliff Barris and I were out swimming one day in the surf, and there came running up to us some men, and they said, watch out, the sharks are on the way. There was a shark alert up, and we were out swimming right where the sharks were supposed to be. 
And we had a girl in Australia that played in one of our motion pictures, The Shadow of the Boomerang. She played the part of a nurse, and she was a very wonderful girl. And she went out with her fiancé, and the boat got stuck in the water or in the sand. And she got out to help lift the boat off the sand, and she wasn't in water more than waist deep. And a shark came along and took off her leg. And she died before they could get any medical attention to her. And down in Daytona Beach, Florida, they said they had five shark attacks on humans this past year. But this is the year of the big fish stories, both factual and fictional. And it's interesting to me that at the same time this picture's come out frightening people, we have another picture called the Towering Inferno and another one called Earthquake. Besides all the B pictures with all their horror, and monster pictures that are coming out to frighten people. No wonder people are biting their fingernails off and taking tranquilizers and afraid to move in their sleep at night. There's never been such an avalanche of horror and fright and some of it very sophisticated to descend upon the human race. And in addition to that, we have to think about the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And so we're living at a time when people Jesus said their hearts would fail them for fear. And today, if ever there was a frightened generation from almost every angle, it is today. But that's not what I want to talk about. I like Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the big fish, better than I do Jaws, because Jonah was saved, not destroyed, by a big fish. You say, Billy, do you really believe that this fish swallowed Jonah. Notice I'm calling it a fish because the Bible says a big fish was prepared by the Lord. It doesn't call it a whale. It does in this passage in the New Testament, but in the book of Jonah, it says a big fish. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a big shark for all I know. Do you say, do you believe that actually happened? Yes, I believe it. Why? Because Jesus said it did. And that's all the proof I need. If Jesus believed it, then I believe it. But I believe that it took an even bigger miracle for this particular fish to be on the very spot where Jonah was thrown overboard and then by some mysterious programming of an internal computer to deposit Jonah precisely on the spot where God wanted him to be. And with all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting this story than they did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, they'd laugh at Jonah and the big fish, but not today, after we've seen Jaws and some of these other things. And after all the scientific and technological achievements, and every once in a while, you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll find that a man or a crocodile or an alligator or something has been swallowed by a big fish and they found him inside the fish, having never been digested, whatever. Now, the story of Jonah is one of the most thrilling stories in all the Bible. It's only four little chapters. In fact, you could read it in about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. And the scripture says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go and preach judgment to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh had 600,000 population. And Nineveh was a city that was very wicked and very godless and very materialistic. It was a permissive society. Sexual immorality was rampant throughout Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to warn them that they are going to be judged in 40 days unless they repent. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Every Christian that is here tonight is called to ministry. Yes, you're called. I didn't say you were called to the ministry. I said you were called to ministry. Do you know what the word ministry means? The word ministry means service. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant. 
to serve. And every Christian is called to be a servant, to serve, to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve his fellow man. Jonah was called of God to go and proclaim the message that God had given him. But secondly, Jonah refused. You know, it's tough to do the will of God. You, you say to God tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'll do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go and be what you want me to be, and you're going to find tough going. Because, you see, to do what God wanted him to do, it was several journeys away over mountains and forests and burning deserts. And Nineveh was the wickedest city in the world, a city of 600,000 people. He would face disease and wild beasts and highway robbers, and then when he got there, the people may stone him to death. And Jonah began to run from God. Jonah couldn't take it. So he decided to flee from the presence of God and he went down to Joppa and he got on a boat going to Tarshish and the scripture says he paid the fare thereof. And I want to tell you something. If you start running from the Lord, the devil will always have a boat there for you. And you'll always have the money to pay the way. And at first it'll be smooth going you'll say, boy, I've made the right choice. I know I'm not doing God's will, but I'm doing what I want to do, and I know that I have made the right choice. But after a while, you're going to start running into some rough seas. Then the storms and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the rocks and the reefs are going to come. No man ever turned away from God and found happiness and peace and joy that was permanent and lasting. The psalmist asked, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? And you know, Jonah thought he had paid the fare. And the captain thought so too. But then the storm came up. And the sailors were frightened. Jonah was asleep. And they said, what's wrong with our ship? Somebody on the ship must have displeased their God. And they began to pray to their gods. Isn't it strange how people began to pray when they're in trouble and maybe they haven't prayed in all their lives? They began to pray. And finally, Jonah told them that he was the one after they'd cast lots and the lot came to Jonah. He confessed that he was running from God. And they said, what will we do with you, Jonah? He said, throw me overboard. They said, no, we'll try something else first. And they began to row and row and row, and they threw everything else over. But the storm got worse and worse, and it looked like the ship was going to be wrecked. So finally, in desperation, they threw Jonah over, and immediately the sea calmed down. And the Bible says that Jonah was caught by a big fish now you think of the jaws that fish had. How wide his mouth must have been. But see, that was a specially prepared fish by God to be there at that precise moment. And let me tell you, when you run from God, you're going to be under God's judgment. And Jonah had three days and three nights in the belly of that fish to think. And brother, let me tell you, he was doing some thinking. And he was doing some praying. He was saying, Lord, save me, help me. I don't know where I am. What's happened? And God said, Jonah, I called you into my service and told you what to do, and you've refused me. Now, Jonah, if you're willing to repent of your sin, I'll give you another chance. And Jonah said, Yes, Lord, I repent. I'll keep my vow. And the Bible says on the third day, the fish vomited up Jonah. And Jonah found himself on dry land. And the scripture says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. 
Now, God doesn't give many of us a second chance like that. But he gave Jonah a second chance. And Jonah ran as fast as he could in every way he could straight to Nineveh. And he went up and down the streets of Nineveh crying out, Repent! Turn to God! Judgment's coming in 40 days! Repent, repent, repent! Of course, he didn't expect anybody to repent. But do you know what happened? That was the greatest and most successful evangelistic campaign in the history of the world. There's never been anything recorded in history like it. The king, the people, 600,000 of them repented and turned to God. And God spared Nineveh. Suppose everybody in Washington suddenly repented and turned to God. And the people of America turned to God as we approach this bicentennial year. What a glorious and thrilling thing it would be. And I want to tell you this, if we did it, God would spare us. But if we don't, this country is in for judgment. Tonight, you as an individual can resist God's call to you and go deeper and deeper in sin. Or you can turn back to God and obey God and do God's will. Which is it going to be? There are many of you young people that have come to Texas Tech University. And you have gotten away from God. You need to come back to him tonight. And God will forgive the past. And give you another chance and another moment. To serve and follow him. And I'm going to ask you to do that in just a few minutes. Jonah preached the gospel of judgment. But you know, there was an interesting thing about the message that he preached. There was no mercy in it. He didn't offer the people mercy. He didn't tell them that God loved them. But tonight, I have an opportunity to say to you much more than Jonah said to the people of Nineveh. I can say to you tonight that God loves you and God is a merciful God and God will forgive you. But Jonah didn't say that. He just said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, repent, repent. And the people repented. And that's why Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up at the judgment and testify against you. You see, they repented. Never hearing the gospel of mercy and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But you've heard the gospel of grace in Christ and you have refused to repent. They'd never heard that Jesus Christ was to die on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that God loved them so much that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. But in spite of that, they repented. And Jesus said, they are going to be your accusers on the day of judgment. They will testify against you. But then something very interesting happened. Jonah was upset. He didn't want Nineveh to repent. You see, he was obeying God's call to go and proclaim the message, but his heart still wasn't quite right with God because he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to attack his own country, Israel. And he had prophesied that judgment was coming and he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he wanted to see judgment come. He wanted to be able to say, I told you so. But he didn't know the mercy and the grace and the love of God that would take these wicked, godless Ninevites and forgive them and change them and transform them if they would only turn to him. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is willing to forgive anybody, even you, whatever your sins are, however bad you've been. God says, I love you. I gave my son for you. I forgive you. 
But Jonah didn't like that, so he went outside the city and got up on top of a hill and looked down over the city, and he had a, a hard, mean scowl on his face as he looked down on the city, waiting for God to burn it up. And the hot wind and the sun came, and he was tired and he was angry. And the Bible says that God allowed during the night a gourd to grow up by a miracle and covered Jonah. And the next morning, a worm came and cut it off and it fell. And Jonah sat there in the sun and the hot wind blowing on him. And God said, Jonah, you're worried about that gourd. And you love that gourd more than you do those 600,000 people of Nineveh. And that's how the book of Jonah ends. And tonight, many of you are more interested in materialism, your own personal safety. You're interested more in the things that money can buy and the comforts of life and the affluency that we've developed in the United States. You are more interested in that than you are doing the will of God and sharing in the mercy and the grace of God. And let me tell you, you're going to have to make a choice. Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road and the narrow road. There are two destinies, heaven and hell. There are two ways to live, two masters, materialism and God. Which is your master? Which road are you on? And God has put a little computer down inside of you.